Okay, so last time we met, we had been talking through Lewis structures that break the octet rules. It's just a quick reminder on all the rules that we're following as we're going through this lecture. You can't have more than eight electrons in your second period elements. And of course, your first two, right? Hydrogen and helium can only have two. But when you get to that second period, you cannot have more than two. You're allowed to have less than two. It doesn't happen a lot, but it happens a lot with things like beryllium and boron. But you know, whatever you do, no more than no more than eight electrons. So you can't put five bonds on nitrogen or carbon or anything like that. And your third period elements, we talked about when you get down there, now you have all these d orbitals that you're allowed to use, and you're allowed to use those in order to form bonds that have more than eight electrons total. So you're allowed to give them 10 or 12 electrons if need be. And we had started working through some Lewis structures that had that and showed us that. So you're gonna have some commonly ones, commonly used ones that you wanna get used to seeing. Ones that'll have less than eight. A lot of times beryllium will just form two bonds, leaving it with four electrons. Aluminum will a lot of times do three, leaving just six valence electrons. And boron does the same thing. It will oftentimes just have three. So back to our Lewis structures that we'd been kind of working through in class last time. So we'd already done a bunch, and this is where we left off with POCl3. And so remember our first step whenever we do these Lewis structures is to count up all of our electrons. So we need to go through and we need to say, well, we have five from the phosphorus, six from the oxygen, seven from each chlorine. So that at the end of all of this, we know exactly how many we have to deal with. Okay, so when we go through and we put this in, we start with our central element. In this case, most of the time it's gonna be the first one written in something of this sort, but sometimes it won't be. It's also usually the least electronegative element. So in this case, that follows. So we put our phosphorus here, and we put all of our other units around it. Now, if you go through and you put in all your electrons and you form all of your octets, you'll find something interesting that we didn't find with the other ones. We have a little bit of a choice. So we could do this, and if we did this, everything has an octet, so everything is technically happy. But if we go a little bit further with this now, remember we also talked about formal charges. And we were, I had told you to go home and practice doing the formal charges with the other Lewis structures that we drew. But now we need to actually do it with this one because you're gonna find something interesting. So let's go through and do that. For our oxygen, what you'll see is that you have eight valence electrons from the periodic table but here it owns seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then one from the bond. So that's a negative one. And if you do it for phosphorus, you'll see that phosphorus has five from the periodic table. And here it only owns four. One, two, three, four. So it has a plus one. So now we have a minus one and a plus one charge. They're sitting right next to each other and we can do away with those charges. So you're always looking to minimize formal charges when you draw Lewis structures. Remember in our NNO example, we, we wanted to pick the Lewis structure with the lowest formal charges. We wanna do the same things here. So this actually isn't going to be correct. What you need to do is you need to form a double bond to that oxygen. and then give everything else the octets like you did before. And now what you'll see is that everything has an octet except phosphorus. Phosphorus has more than an octet, but that's okay. But now all of your formal charges are equal to zero. And so that is, that's more um, stable than having this structure where you have formal charges. So this would be your correct Lewis structure. Okay, a few more to work through. Now we have ClF4 minus, so moving on to doing some ions. 
So same rules as always, first step, count up all your electrons. So we have seven from the chlorine, plus seven from each fluorine. And then don't forget that you have to add one more because of that, right? We have a negative charge, so that's one more electron added in. So we get 36 electrons total. We put our least electronegative one, which is normally listed first in our center. So we put our chlorine in our center. And we put everything else around it. Now, if you fill in all your octets, this is one of those places where having counted your electrons first will keep you from making a silly mistake. So if we fill all these in, and now everything has an octet, but if you just walk away now, you, were, you wouldn't realize that you were missing four electrons. You really only have 32 here, but you had 36. So you have to remember to put those in. So now we have to decide, well, where do they go? They can't go on the fluorine. Fluorine, all of our fluorines already have eight. They had eight just by making that one bond. We can't give fluorine more than eight, so it can't be that one. So we have to put it on the chlorine. And so we'll put it in like that and put both lone pairs on the chlorine. Okay. So now we'll move on and we'll talk about some other, another situation that occurs when you have Lewis structures called resonance. So what happens with resonance is that a molecule can have more than one Lewis structure and they're all equally stable. They're all allowed. There's no reason why it should be one over top of the other. There's not, like when we were talking about our NNO example and we had three different, they're sort of unequal resonance structures you could call them, but there's definitely one that was most stable. This is something a little bit different. This is saying that they're all equally stable. They're all just as likely to happen. So this happens when you can move around electrons, not molecules. So whenever you're drawing resonance structures, if you have to take hydrogen off somewhere and put it someplace else, that's no longer really a resonance structure. You have to just be able to move electrons around, which means you can move around lone pairs and you can move around bonds and that's it. Now, in reality, we're gonna draw three Lewis structures, let's say to three different resonance structures to make up this Lewis structure. And technically you do have to have all three for it to be correct. If I tell you to draw the resonance, or if I tell you to draw the Lewis structure for NO3 and you only draw me one structure, technically you're wrong unless I specifically ask you to just draw me one. And the reason for that is that in reality, just one of those isn't a real accurate representation of what's happening. You have to have all three of them because in reality, it's a mixture of all three. So we're gonna go through these three examples so that we can kind of look at the different ways that this can be done. Okay, so the first one we have is NO3. So you're gonna go through this exactly like we did before. There's really no difference to the start of it. So we add up our electrons, and this should actually be NO3 minus. Okay, so when you go through and you write all of this out, you're gonna put your nitrogen in your center and you're gonna put your oxygens around. Now, if you go to do this and you fill in all of your electrons exactly as we did before, what you're gonna find is that you are short two electrons. And whenever you're short two electrons, that means that you need to go ahead and make a double bond. So we'll make our double bond. We'll just put it there for now. Now let's fill in all of our octets. And so we can do that. Now, a good question might come up and say, well, let's look at our formal charges a second. And if we look at our nitrogen, this is where we wanna start getting kinda of good at formal charges and we don't wanna to have to necessarily write them down all the time. So we're just gonna do it out loud. So if we look at nitrogen, we say our valence electrons, we look at a periodic table, we have five. And here we only have four, one, two, three, four. So we have a plus one charge here. Now if we look at these oxygens, we would have six from the periodic table, but each one of them has seven. So each one of these oxygens is gonna have a negative one charge. 
So now if you think back to the example that we just did, just one moment ago, with the POCl3, and we made a double bond to fix that. And I said, well, you know, hey, we have a, a negative one and a plus one right next to each other. You can fix that by making another double bond. Can we do that here? Well, if you go ahead and you draw it out, what you're gonna find is that now nitrogen has 10 electrons and nitrogen's not allowed to do that. So, and this is a case where you can't minimize formal charges. You're stuck with what you have. So we're, we're gonna just leave it there. Now to get into this idea of resonance structures though, why did I put the double bond here? Well, why couldn't I have taken and drawn it like this? And instead, put the double bond at the bottom left. And put our two negative charges here. Or for that matter, why couldn't I have done it over here? And when it comes down to it, there's really no reason I picked the one I did. And in reality, all these are completely equal. And so to accurately represent this molecule, you have to actually draw all of them out. You can't just leave it as one or the other. And so if I were to ask you to draw this on a midterm, technically, you would have to draw all three unless I just asked you to draw one. Now, going back to what I had mentioned in the slide where all of these are equal, there's no reason why it should have been put in one or the other. So it's not like our N and O example where there was a distinct preferred choice where we put the negative on the most electronegative element. In this case, we're just putting them on different oxygen. So they're all equally stable. We didn't move anything around, right? We didn't move atoms around. We didn't pick up an atom and detach it someplace else. We just moved the double bonds and the lone pairs around. So we were only moving electrons. So all of these are equally stable. All of these are allowed. And so there's no difference there. Okay, so moving on to another very similar one. We have HCO2 minus. So when we go to draw this one, we count up our electrons. And we put our least electronegative element in the center and we draw everything off from it. So we have two oxygens and a hydrogen. And so we draw it this way. A little bit of a spoiler there on that double bond. But if you go through and you draw just the single bonds, you'll see that you're short an electron or two electrons, so you need to make a double bond. So I chose to put it here, but there is no reason why I couldn't have chose to put it down here. So let's draw this out. And this puts the minus charge on here. So now let's draw the resonant structure. So this is where you say, well, why did I put it here as opposed to here? There's no reason. It's not that it makes it more or less stable. It's just we kind of had to pick one of them. So we can draw the other one. And so both of those are equally stable. So both of those are, are need to be there to be completely accurate. Now let's think about what I said about having them actually be a mix of the electron or the mix of the structures. So what I mean by that is that not one of these accurately represents it. What in reality is happening is this minus charge is being shared equally amongst all of them. This double bond is being shared equally amongst all of them. And so it's in reality a mix of each of these. If we were to measure this bond length, it wouldn't be that two of them came out to have a single bond and one of them came out to be a double bond and if we measure it really, really fast, we'd see that they were all switching. No, it wouldn't be doing that. It would actually be in the middle of all of them. And so if we go back and we look at our next slide, we can see some, some, a little bit more of what's going on when we can look at the shapes. So if we look at this as sort of our NO3, and I have all three resonance structures drawn out here. And we look at this double bond moving around. What actually ends up happening is that all of them contribute equally and you end up with sort of, there's, there's different ways you can draw it, but one of the ways that they'll sometimes draw it is with like a dotted line going across here. And what that means is that these electrons are delocalized. They don't belong to any one specific place. 
what happens is, is that all those p orbitals, so if we look at this and we think about where our p orbitals are and what they look like, they're gonna bond here and here and here. And as we move on in chapter two and chapter three, you'll have a better idea of exactly how those geometries work. But for right now, you can just think about the p orbitals being spread out over the whole thing. And so those are called delocalized. So electrons that are in these sort of areas where you have this resonance are called delocalized electrons. And we'll revisit that off and on as we start learning more about how the shapes look and how the geometries look and everything of that sort. So to um, sort of also add to something else that helps with homework and things of that sort, when we look at these, I talked about sort of the bond as being split between the three. So if we were to measure these bond lengths, what you would actually come out with, a bond length of about four thirds, which makes sense because we have one, two, three, four bonds being split between three different sections, three different atoms. And so that's four bonds divided by three is four thirds. And the same thing would happen if you were to be able to measure the charges, how much of a negative charge those oxygens have. You would have one, two, three, or excuse me, one, two negatives split between three atoms. And so you'd come out with about a negative two thirds charge. So that comes up off and on in your homework. Okay, now we're gonna move on to something that's a little bit off subject and is not technically covered in this chapter of your book, but it's something that people forget to teach you guys until it's really too late and we're already using them. This comes up a lot in organic chemistry and you'll get really, really good at them in organic chemistry. But you need to have a little bit of an idea of how to do them and how to work with them before you get there. So that when you see them in a book, you know what's going on. And it never gets formally taught um, many places here. So I, I chose to put it in here with all of this bonding when we're really getting into the structures and what molecules look like and things of that sort. So these are gonna be called line structures. So here I have the rules written out for you, but really the, the only way to get good at this is to do lots of practice. So keep this sort of by you as we're doing these so you can follow along with the rules. But the reason why we want to have these line structures is because it makes it really fast for us to be able to draw them. So right now we've been working with pretty small molecules, you know, four or five different atoms all combined together. But when you start you know, looking at these big, let's say different types of drugs, um, prescription drugs, things of that sort, molecules, now you're getting these really huge molecules. And if you have to draw every single carbon and every single hydrogen and every single atom in that molecule, it starts to get a little bit tedious. Um, if you, you know, in your bio classes, you've probably seen different hormones and things of that sort. And you can imagine having to draw those out in its full glory Lewis structure as we've been doing and how much room that would take up and how tiring that would get. Line structure says, hey, we know some things about molecules, especially organic ones. We know how these things act. We don't need to draw everything in. So whenever you see a corner or you see an end of a line, so we'll skip ahead a bit into this just so I can show you. So a corner or just an end of a line, that's gonna be a carbon. So you just go ahead and assume anytime you have a little corner, that's a carbon. Anytime you come to the end of a line and there's not some other atom written there, that's a carbon too. You assume that carbon is gonna have four bonds. So if carbon has four bonds already and you can see all of those four bonds drawn in, you don't really have to do anything with that carbon. That's just a carbon. Now, if you have something like this, where look at this carbon, it only has one, two. Okay, well that means that it has two more bonds somewhere. Carbon likes to have four bonds. So hydrogens, you can assume that they're there. We just don't draw them in. So this carbon, because it has two bonds here and it needs two more, this carbon must have two hydrogens attached that we just aren't able to see at the moment. And that saves us a lot of time when we're drawing these out. Okay. So then all your other atoms, those have to be drawn in, and any hydrogens that are on those atoms, those have to be drawn in too. So really your only things that you're watching out for here is carbons that are corners or end of a line, and all the hydrogens that are attached to the carbon. There's, other, there's one other big thing that comes in when we start talking about hybridization. We don't draw lone pairs. So in Lewis structures, we always had to draw out all our lone pairs, so we always knew as soon as we looked at an atom how many lone pairs it had. In line structures, we don't. And that's gonna come into play a lot when we start doing VSEPR theory and hybridization and things of that sort when we care about what those lone pairs are and whether they're there or not. In line structures, we don't draw them. 
So first let's practice drawing some and then we'll go on to a few more complicated ones that I wouldn't expect you to be able to draw. I couldn't do it this way and give you this and have um, you draw it or I couldn't just give you the formula and have you draw it. But I would expect you to be able to tell me the empirical formula. But we'll start with this direction. Okay, so here we have them all drawn out. And this way I can point to them a bit. So if we start with this one, when we go to draw these, we put our pencil down and we say, well, that's our first carbon. Now, so we've just put that now. Now we go up. So now we have one, two carbons. So that takes care of those two. We go down one more time. So that's one, two, three carbons. And we have one more to go. So we do that. So now we have one, two, three, four carbons, and we have one, two, three, four carbons. So now we have to worry about our NH2. So we draw a line to go to our NH2, and we draw those in. We don't have to draw on any of the hydrogens. Those are all assumed to be there because this carbon only has one bond. So we have to assume that it has three other ones that we just can't see. So that's one, two, three hydrogens, and here one, two hydrogens, here one, two hydrogens, one, two hydrogens. Now notice on the nitrogen, we have to draw those hydrogens in. You can't assume that the hydrogens are in a heterol atom or anything other than carbon. So we have to go ahead and write that in. So this is how we go about drawing a line structure. Notice this nitrogen, it also has a lone pair, right? That lone pair that we just aren't seeing. So we don't draw that when we draw the line structures, but you do need to know that it's there. Okay, let's do the next one. So we have two carbons and then that's bonded to an oxygen. So we have one, two carbons, one, two carbons, and we come down to the OH, like that. And you don't have to draw a bond in between the oxygen and the hydrogen, you can just write OH. So again, one, two carbons, one, two carbons, and then down to the O. And then you assume that because this has one bond here, it must have three hydrogens. This has two bonds, so it must have two hydrogens. Now moving on to a little bit more complicated one. Now we have this sort of pentagon structure. So since a carbon is a corner, we just have to draw our pentagon. And then all of those hydrogens we can assume to be there. And so we only have to draw in our oxygen, our double bonded oxygen. So you can see how this is a lot easier to draw than that. And how once you get really good at these, you'll look at these and say, okay, well, two bonds there, that means that I have two hydrogens there. Two bonds here, that means I have two hydrogens here, and so on and so forth. So much easier once you get good at it. Okay, now this one. So we have three carbons, so we can go one, two, three. So that's one, two, three, one, two, three. Now on that last carbon, we have two oxygens. One of them is gonna be double bonded. One of them is gonna be single bonded and we're done. So again, to look at this and say, okay, we have one bond here. That means that we have to have three hydrogens, two bonds here. So that means we have to have two more hydrogens, two hydrogens. And then this carbon doesn't have any hydrogens on it because it already has one, two, three, four bonds. So here we have one, two, three, four bonds. And if you looked at this, you would say, okay, well, I don't have to worry about hydrogens there. So that's going in that direction. Now let's go in the opposite direction. Now let's look at this one and say, okay, well, how can we figure out the empirical formula for a structure that looks like this? So first we need to start with something. Usually it's a good idea to start with carbons. Until you get good at these, it's also a good idea to go ahead and draw everything in. But while you're drawing in hydrogens, I would draw in your lone pairs too. So if we start with all of our corners, we have a carbon right here, 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 here and here, one right there, there. Now this one is drawn in. This is one of those, sometimes you'll see them draw in these CH3 groups, sometimes you won't. So I could have just as easily left that a blank and let, leave it as just an end of a line and you would have to know to put in the CH3 groups. It's drawn both ways. And then over here is CH3 groups. So you count all of them up and you have one, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven carbons. So you know that it's going to be C11. Now the hydrogens are a bit more tricky. So if we look at this one, we have two bonds already, and so we're going to need two more bonds. Here we have one, two, three, four bonds, so we're all set there. We're not going to have any hydrogens there. We look here, and it's the same thing. One, two, three, four bonds. So no hydrogens there. So we still just have these two. Now we come up here and we see that we have three bonds, which means that we must have one other one that we can't see. So that's a hydrogen. So two hydrogens, one hydrogen. Same thing here, one, two, three. So we must have another hydrogen. Same thing here. Now we look at this one and it has four bonds. And so we know that, okay, we're all set. So no, no hydrogens there. So we're up to two, three, four, five. Two off here gives us six and seven. And then three bonds here means that there must be one more, so we're up to eight. And then nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So we're up to 15 hydrogens. So we have C11, H15. Now for the other atoms, you just go ahead and they're all drawn out for you, so you just have to write them in. So NO2. So we have C11, H15, NO2. And going through and drawing them out the first few times is, is fine. It's more than recommended. Now let's look at this one. So let's look at our carbons. So we know each corner here is going to be a carbon. So that gives us our six. And then this one here is seven, eight. So we have eight carbons total. Now we go through and we do our hydrogens, the more difficult one of the group. So we have one here and one here. We look here and here, and you can see for both of these, they have four bonds already, so no hydrogen. We look here, we only have three bonds, so there's gonna be a hydrogen there. Same thing for this one, and same thing for this one. They all only have three bonds, so they all need a hydrogen. So we're up to one, two, three, four, five. We look at this one, there's four bonds, so we're all set. This one, there's two bonds, so we need two more. So six, seven. Here we have two bonds, so we need two more. Eight, nine. And here we have them already written out, so 10, 11. So we have C8, H11 so far. Now we just go through and count up all our other ones. So we have a nitrogen and we have two oxygens, so NO2. So we get C8, H11, NO2. Okay. Now let's look at sort of an interesting structure just because it's, and again, this is a little, it goes along with the other things that we've been talking about, but this gets into the P um, orbital delocalization too. And it's a good place to kind of put it in now that we see what these structures look like. So this takes, this brings in these resonance structures that we've been drawing in with the line structures. Line structures aren't any different. You can draw resonance structures with them just like you can Lewis structures. So if we look at this structure, this is benzene. And that's just, a, that's just the name that you would need to know for it. So if you look at each one of these, each one of these corners would be a carbon, and then each one would have a hydrogen off. Now, there is no reason in this case to draw benzene with this, the double bonds here, here, and here. You could equally draw them here, here, and here. And so that means that we have a resonance structure between these two, where we can draw the double bonds alternating this way or the double bonds alternating that way. Here's it drawn out with the hydrogens, just so that you can see that each one would have to have a hydrogen. Now, one of the other ways that you'll see this drawn, because these are all delocalized and they are all shared equally, remember a resonance structure really means that it's somewhere in between, that each one of these would be like one and a half bonds. And so sometimes you'll also see it just drawn like this, with a circle. So benzene, is, it, it, comes in lots of, it comes in lots of different applications, and it's something to be aware of and something to know exists. You'll see these groups lots of different places, and when you get further into organic, you'll start calling them aromatics and things of that sort. So in this case, this gives you a little bit better picture of how P orbital delocalization works. In this case, it's over the entire ring. So these right here are meant to, rec are meant to represent your P orbitals. So one lobe of the P orbital, the other lobe of the P orbital, and those P orbitals are forming those double bonds, that second bond to each one. And so you get this big ring of orbital. 
and that's how this looks. So this is sort of a resonance structure that shows you the p orbital delocalization over the entire thing. And you can now kind of imagine the NO3 looking the exact same way. Okay. Now we're gonna do a little bit of um, more talking about electronegativity. We sort of already talked about the trends before. Now we're gonna get into it all a little bit more and talk about polar bonds and things of that sort a little bit more intensely than we did before. Before we just sort of talked about it as this tendency of an electron to share or steal, I guess, to, to take more of the electron density away from its bonding partner. And that was really all we talked about. We talked about the trends, right? So we talked about as you go across the periodic table this way, we are increasing our electronegativity. Something like fluorine and oxygen and nitrogen are extremely electronegative. Things over here aren't. We talked about how as we go up the periodic table, we have increased electronegativity, which means that fluorine's very electronegative. Things down here are not. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about more how this applies to actual chemistry. So remember that in this case, there's not a lot of exceptions, right? That was one of the nice things about electronegativity when we took our exam on that, is that you didn't have to worry about all the exceptions. And that's because they already have a stable octet, or if they're breaking the octet, they're in a stable electron configuration. So because of that, we got this nice kind of smooth slope all the way up following the trend, with just a few exceptions that we didn't worry about too much. Now let's talk about how this electronegativity and how the differences in the electronegativity between two elements that are bonded to each other are gonna affect properties of a molecule. So polarity is something that you may, have heard, may or may not have heard of. And this occurs, a polar molecule or a polar bond occurs when two elements that have very different electronegativities are bonded to each other. So if we look back here, if we have something on this side of the periodic table bonded to something over here where there's, there's a difference in electronegativity, these elements, they're gonna be stealing all the electron density toward themselves. And so if, you, if an element has more electron density being pulled toward it, it's gonna have a positive charge or a negative charge. Well, more electron density, electrons are negatively charged, so it's gonna be a bit more negative than positive. So if you take something like HF or HLI and you look at their electronegativities, you can see that there's a difference between them. And because of that, the electron density isn't shared equally. In this case, hydrogen is more electronegative, so it steals it away from the lithium, giving it, it an unequal distribution. In something like this, you have this hydrogen fluorine and it's sharing it unequally. And so now the fluorine has a little bit of a negative charge. And something like I3 would be nonpolar, right? Iodine is just iodine. They're all gonna have the same electronegativity. They're all being you know, spaced out equally. So they're all sharing it completely equally. There's no difference in electronegativity here. But here and here there would be. Now, this gets into the idea that there's a gradient between this, right? If we share something here and here, let's say, okay, well that's a polar and it's not sharing equally this would steal more of the electron density than this. But it's not quite the same thing as if you take something like this and bond it with something over here that has a very, very low electronegativity. So there's a difference in the differences in electronegativity, right? We have small differences and big differences. And so that's what this is getting into. If there's just a ridiculously tiny amount of difference in electronegativity or they're exactly the same, it's not gonna be a polar bond. If you have a, a, a molecule, two molecules, excuse me, or two atoms bonded together, and their difference is a little, is less than two, so there is a difference, but it's not that big of a difference, then it's gonna be a polar covalent bond. Now, if it becomes greater than two, that's when we get into the fact that now it's basically stealing a whole electron or more worth of electron density, and that becomes an ionic bond. So, this, gets, this, this fixes our original definition of the difference between ionic and polar covalent, or excuse me, ionic and covalent. Before we had talked about ionic being a metal and a non-metal, right? Metal, non-metal. And we talked about covalent being all non-metals. And now we can kind of see why. If you have things over here, they're all about, you know, they're, they're relatively similar in electronegativity. They're not hugely different. And so they're gonna be covalent. 
maybe they're polar covalent, but they're still gonna be covalent. If you take something from this side of the periodic table and something from this side of the periodic table, now there's a huge difference between the two. And so now that's stealing so much electron density over to this side that you're getting more of an ionic situation. So if we put that in a little bit more you know, concrete terms, the electrons that have that nucleus pull on the electrons far, farther away are electronegativity or electronegative. So something like fluorine taking something from potassium. It's such a large difference that it's now gonna take basically a whole electron's worth. This is how we can decide on something called ionic character. So now it's not as simple as just covalent or ionic. Now we have this gradient that I've sort of referred to off and on through the quarter. So if we look at something like KCl and Ki, and we wanna know, well, which one has more ionic character? We can look at the K and we can look at the CL, and we can look at the K and we can look at the I. Now, we could do this probably without having the numbers in front of us as well, but I, I put them here just so you can put some numbers on it as well. So we have potassium and chlorine, which has you know, a, a fairly large difference, and we have potassium and iodide, which also is a fairly large difference, but not quite as much. So because Cl minus, or excuse me, because Cl, is so much more electronegative than Ki, or than I, KCl is gonna have more ionic character. The difference in electronegativity between here and here is more than the difference in electronegativity between here and here. So K and I are gonna share those electrons just a little bit more evenly, where K and Cl, the Cl is gonna kinda of be the bully here and take away more of the electron density because it's more electronegative. And so KCl has a greater difference in electronegativity the, K, the CL is pulling on those electrons more, it's making that bond more ionic. And here's a sort of graph that kind of graphs this out so you can see a little bit too. So here we have electronegativity difference. So that's if we take something from you know, here and here and we subtract the two values, our electronegativity difference. And we have percent ionic character. So you can measure how, how much those are ionic or more or just polar covalent or not at all. And so we get this sort of structure or this sort of line, where the greater the electronegativity difference, the higher the ionic character. And you know, there's a few like little outliers and things of that sort, but for the most part, it follows this curve. And so if you wanna know how, I, how much ionic character something has, you look at the electronegativity differences. The bigger the difference, the more ionic character it has. Okay, so there is exceptions to this idea with polar um, being, a difference in electronegativity. And there's one example that sort of epitomizes this and it's kind of interesting. So we have O3. So this is, this is a weird example. Now with O3, you could kind of think, oh, well that's gonna be like I, right? That's gonna be like I3 minus. All of them have the same electronegativity and so there's not gonna be any sort of polar issue here. It's not quite, it's not quite how it works though. If you draw out the Lewis structure for this, here I just have the line structure drawn. So I don't have any lone pairs. But if you were to add on the lone pairs here, so count up how many electrons O3 has, and then where am I missing? So there'd be two lone pairs here, three here, and one somewhere else. It would be on the oxygen. And we haven't gotten into geometry too much, but I think you can see that, hey, if there's a lone pair here, that lone pair is gonna take up some room. And so that lone pair is gonna kind of push it this direction. Now, if you look at how these electrons are distributed, you notice there's formal charges here. And there's nothing we can do to fix that. We can't put a double bond here to fix it like we did with our POCl3 example. And if you look at it, keeping in mind that there's a lone pair here, why couldn't we put, a lone, why couldn't we put this bond here? It's gonna break your octet rule, right? If we had two, four, six, eight, ten electrons on an oxygen, it's not allowed. You can't do that on your second period elements. So we're stuck with this sort of distribution of electrons, which means that if you look at this resonance structure, there's going to be a delta positive and a delta negative on it. And so it's kind of this weird situation where you have three atoms that are identical. They're all oxygens. So they all have the exact same electronegativity, but the distributions of electrons set it up so that they're going to actually be polar. It does have a dipole, it is gonna be polar. And so we'll get more into the details of the geometry and more into the details of how you know if an atom is polar, but 
it is interesting to note that there's some exceptions to um, some odd situations that you need to kind of keep in mind. It's not always quite as simple as just looking at the differences in electronegativities. We're gonna have to look at geometries and things too. Okay, so before we go do some more examples and looking at polar bonds and things of that sort, I thought there was some, some interesting applications that sort of combine the two things that we learned, chapter one and this. So if we take, and I've shown you some of these before, and if we have something like microwaves, so we know what microwaves are now. We have an idea of what microwaves are now. We know that they're just electromagnetic radiation and that this electromagnetic radiation, and that this electromagnetic radiation has wavelengths and we know that the only thing that really makes microwaves special in this case is that it's in that particular region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so if we're in that particular region of the electromagnetic spectrum, what happens is, is that these microwaves are able to actually go ahead and excite um, water molecules. So when you microwave something, what you're really doing is you're taking water molecules and you're moving them around. And so there's this little demo from the, the FET website, which I think I've shown you before, where if we turn the microwave on, those waves are gonna take and they're gonna bounce water molecules around. So you turn on a microwave, you have water molecules moving around, and all of these are bumping into each other, rubbing against each other, and when things do that, what does it make? Well, it makes friction, right? And if you have friction between things, if you sit and you go like this and you build up friction in your hands, what happens? Your hands get warm. So the same thing happens here. You use microwaves, things that we learned about in chapter one, and microwaves excite polar molecules, okay? So they excite polar molecules. So water is gonna be polar, right? We have oxygen, which is really electronegative. We have hydrogen, which isn't super electronegative, more than you would think for where it's at in the periodic table, but um, it's besides the point. And so definitely polar molecule. So the microwaves can excite those, bounce them around, and the friction heats up the food. Now, why can't you put metal in a microwave? Why would that make any difference? Well, it's not necessarily that you can't put metal in a microwave. It's that you have to worry about this, this and this isn't necessarily related to this, but it is, it is an interesting little concept. So it's not that you can't put metal in a microwave, it's just that if you do, if you put a container, a big heavy container in a microwave, it's gonna block all the electromagnetic radiation. It's gonna take and it's gonna stop all the microwaves from getting into the water. And so the water can't heat up, and then therefore your food can't heat up because the metal just bounces the electromagnetic radiation, the microwaves back at the thing. Now that's for like real metal or heavy metal, you know, big, big bowls of metal, things of that sort. If you've ever put tin foil or just small things of metal into a microwave, then you may have noticed that suddenly you start getting sparks, right? And that's just because now you're kind of exciting the electrons around. So this actually shows you how you can do it in a very controlled manner. Maybe. There we go. So here they have a microwave and they're gonna put a light bulb in it. So a light bulb is good in the sense that it has metal in it, so it shows you what happens if you put metal in it, yet it's also very controlled. It's in an inert atmosphere, so it's not gonna burn, it's not gonna spark, but it will light it up. So you can see that, okay, it's, it's really just that you're burning, you're, you're burning metal, right? You're sending electricity through metal by heating it up. And so this shows you that, hey, you can do it if you have it in an inner atmosphere. It's just normally you get something, you get the sparks because the metal, the electrons are going through the metal. This is kind of a cool little video that shows you that. So that's a whole different phenomena than the way that the water works. So they're not necessarily related. So now we're gonna go back to those Lewis structures, the Lewis structures that I've told you we're gonna keep out pretty much the entire time, all the time. And we're gonna go through and we're gonna decide which bonds are polar. 
Now be careful here. We're not deciding which molecules are polar. We're deciding which ones have polar bonds. We can't really get into the idea of polar molecules quite yet. You just don't, you, we haven't quite covered that material. But we can go through now and we can say, okay, which bonds are polar? And so we're gonna go back through all of them and decide that. Okay, so back to the very beginning. Give it a second to adjust. So if we look at N2, so this is kind of a nice example to start off with, right? We have a nitrogen bonded to a nitrogen, so there's not gonna be any difference in electronegativity there. They're all gonna be the exact same. So this one is gonna have no polar bonds. Now, moving on to the next one. If we have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So, wrong one. We have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So this one we had drawn out like this. We had decided that this was the proper, the proper way of drawing it because of the way the formal charges worked and because of how our octet works. Now, if we look at this, which ones are polar here? So if you look at carbon and hydrogen, there's a very, very, very tiny difference in electronegativity. It's such a small difference that we don't consider that a polar bond. But now between carbon and oxygen, if you look at those, that's definitely polar. So this one has polar bonds. And again, we're just deciding if the bonds are polar. We're not deciding if the molecule itself is polar. We're not quite there yet. We have to do some VSEPR theory first. Now, if we look at XCF4 four, four plus. This one, we have a noble gas in the center. So noble gases are definitely not very electronegative. And we have all of these fluorines. Fluorines are definitely very electronegative. So all bonds are polar. So that one, just they're all gonna be polar. And then we'll come back and we'll decide which one of these um, have polar molecules here in a few lessons. So now let's look at our NO2. So this was our, our big complicated example, right? Where we had to go through and we had to draw all these different, what we're now calling resonance structures, where we move the electrons around. But this resonance structure was different than the other ones because these were unequal, right? The other ones were all equally shared. And so those were, were resonance structures that you had to draw all of them. This one, you had just have to draw the most stable one because this one is better than these options. So we're just looking at this one. And we say, well, which one of these have polar bonds? Well, this bond has a formal charge that makes it uh, a little, little bit, but we'll not to pay too much attention to that one. And let's look at this bond though. This bond is definitely polar, right? We have a nitrogen and an oxygen. We have a negative formal charge here and a positive formal charge here. And so this one's gonna definitely be polar bond. Okay. Now we look at SF6. So we look at SF6 and we look at the differences in polarities and where they are, and we know that our nitrogen and our oxygen and our fluorines are super electronegative. They all fall on that section of the periodic table where they're very, very highly electronegative. Sulfur, not so much, it's sort of more in between. And so every one of these bonds are polar. Now, you'll notice as we're going through these, and this will happen throughout the rest of the quarter, sometimes I do skip certain Lewis structures for certain applications, and that's just because it doesn't completely apply or there's extra complications that I don't want you to worry about too much. So if you notice that we're skipping a few of them, just don't worry about those. I, I skipped them on purpose. Okay, 
So now we have this one. This is very similar to the other one we did, right? We have X, E, and Fs. The only difference is, is in our other one, we didn't have these lone pairs. And that's gonna matter later on when we talk about geometries and things of that sort. But for right now, when we're just looking at polar bonds, that's the exact same thing as before. Very not polar, or excuse me, very not electronegative, very electronegative, and so all bonds are polar. Now we have H2SO4. And so again, electronegative elements with not very electronegative elements, so all of our bonds are polar. Now, for the most part, and there are exceptions to this, but for the most part, you need to be able to decide whether these are polar, or polar bonds or not just by looking at them. You don't wanna have to be going to the periodic table all the time to make this decision. Um, or excuse me, a periodic table with actual numbers on it. You'll always have a periodic table in front of you. But you don't wanna have to constantly go to the ones with numbers. So when you're doing your homework, with very few exceptions, you shouldn't really be looking at that periodic table that I had in there that had all the numbers on it. You should be just looking at a normal periodic table, like you know, just normal ones that we have around, and deciding, okay, based on where they are in the periodic table, which one's gonna be more polar, or which one's gonna be more electronegative. What are the differences? How close are they? How far away are they? And decide your um, polarity based on that. So now we have POCl3. And so if we look at this, we can decide, okay, are these bonds polar? Well, oxygen, that's one of our three really electronegative elements. Chlorines and our halogens, so those are very electronegative. Phosphorus, not so much, right? Third period, so it's not super far up in the periodic table. You know, group over, so not very electronegative here. So these are all gonna be polar. All right, few more to go. CLF4 minus. So this one may or may not be a little tough, if you, depending. So a lot of times you think of chlorine and fluorine as both being really electronegative, but there is still a pretty big difference between them. Fluorine is still gonna be a lot more electronegative than chlorine. So even though we are comparing two pretty highly electronegative elements, fluorine still wins. Fluorine still gets to steal more of the electron density. And so all bonds are polar here too. So this is sort of one where they're both very electronegative, but they're still going to be all polar. Okay. So that takes us up through our Lewis structures. And I think we'll end there for the day. And then next class, we'll finish up chapter two and start going into some VSEPR theory and deciding how we look at these molecules in actual geometry as opposed to just into a 2D Lewis structure.